Thank you for joining us on our journey here to preserve the history of mixed martial arts. When I wanted to take on this project, I needed help. I brought in one of my favorite matchmakers, Miguel Iterate, and the MMA detective, Mike Davis. So to do this, we've been able to preserve history. Welcome and enjoy. Welcome back to the Lights Out podcast. I'm Chris Lights Out Lytle as well with Mike Miguel and our guest today, old school guy. I love it. Deep dive. Now this is as old school as it get. Uh, Steve Nelson. Steve, how the hell are you doing, brother? I'm good. Good to see you guys. Thanks for having me on your show. Appreciate it. Of course, it. man. Now I always consider myself an old school guy. I've been around for a long time. I started fighting in 1998. I think you predate me by quite a bit. So, um, you know, now we're going to talk about a little bit of your career, but man, how did you get involved at such uh, the onset? I mean, what were you an athlete growing up? What did you do? How did you get involved with the fight world? Uh, my father was a, a amateur wrestler from Canada. He won the nationals freestyle wrestling about three times over there. And then wow. He became a professional wrestler. My grandparents on my mother's side were professional wrestlers. They were, uh, my grandfather went as Pancho Villa or uh, Robert Pico. And my grandmother was Ann Laverne. My mother was Marie Laverne. So I just kind of fell into the pro wrestling business. And I actually was, I mean, I was in wrestling since I was nine and then I was in uh, judo, started about 17, and I uh, went to Oklahoma State to wrestle, and uh, MMA came on the scene with UFC in 93, and I just happened to be starting to do pro wrestling with UWFI in Japan in 1993. So that's, oh, wow. that's kind of how I got started. I was doing pro wrestling in Mexico back in 89, and I was doing some pro wrestling around Texas in that, during that time also. Hey, can I ask you, how how did the, the Sambo play in? Because Sambo is very much associated with your name, but you, you didn't mention it. How how does that bake into that package? Well, when I was in Oklahoma State, I went there in 1982, and we had a wrestler come in from the Marines named Craig Pittman. I'm not sure if any of you guys are familiar with him. He was a silver or bronze medalist at the World Championship, and he started talking about Sambo, so he had some jackets, and I had a judo background from high school, and me and my roommate were interested. So while we were at Oklahoma State, I started going to the Sambo Nationals in 1984 and finished my career in Sambo in 1994. And I coached the kids around Amarillo during that time also. And okay. I, I was going to ask, is that the Craig Pittman that was in the Valley Tudo Japan with you? Uh, I, I was there when, uh, with uh, – um, uh, Tom Erickson was in Valley Tudo with me. I don't remember. I don't remember Craig being in the one that I was in. But Tom he was Erickson in the, he was Yuki Nakai, right? Is that the guy? Who's that, Tom? Uh, no, uh, uh, Craig Pittman. Before yeah, he, he might have done some MMA, but he left Oklahoma State and started doing the pro wrestling for WCW also. Okay. He, went, yeah. he, he, came, he wrestled as, I think, the Sergeant Craig Pittman. Yeah. I mean, you said a lot, even though there was like, a little there, there's actually a lot that, that I don't want to miss. First and foremost, did you say your grandmother was a pro wrestler? Yes, my grandmother's name is Ann, La yeah, Ann Laverne, and she actually got inducted in 2019 into the Pro Wrestling Hall of Fame. Did she ever <laughs> wrestle Chris's favorite manager, Phyllis Lee? <laughs> no, I, I, my grandmother's not alive anymore, but I asked my mother about that. Did did grand did grandma wrestle Phyllis Lee? Uh, you or grandma, and, and she said that her mom never, my grandmother never mentioned it. But uh, I know Phyllis Lee because Phyllis Lee was the person that got me into the World Combat Championships. I was wanting to get a fight, and Dan Severin, she managed him for a while, and then he said, "Well, here's Phyllis's number," so she got me in there, and and then she actually was. Uh, Evan Tanner's a uh, manager yep. for, for a minute or two. I'm not exactly sure what happened with those guys. <laughs> so Chris, do you want to ask Phyllis Lee questions? <laughs> he, he, I would, but he doesn't have the knowledge of, of Phyllis Lee. No, I do know she did imagine, man, if you want to go over and fight in Pancrase, you went through Phyllis Lee. And so when I first started going over there, Evan Tanner was a big name. He'd been fighting over there. So yeah, he had to go through Phyllis. So that's how that management went. Yeah, yeah, she managed a lot of good guys. I uh, 
That, and that might have been how that was might have been his way in. I'm not exactly sure how all that went down, to be honest with you. I can't remember back then. It, it, now, you were also friends with Evan Tanner. I mean, for a long time, obviously. Yes, yes. I I was a wrestling coach in high school here for 27 years. I retired from teaching and coaching back in 2013. And Evan was actually wrestling for Caprock High School. So my team wrestled against Evan. And uh, Evan was a just a phenomenal athlete. He, he started wrestling in 10th grade in high school. And then he won state his junior and senior year. He only wrestled one semester of college. And then he started doing his own thing. And then he started shoot wrestling for me. Hold on, he 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 didn't start till his sophomore year, and he won his junior year, and and destroyed everybody his junior and senior year, and he didn't start wrestling until his sophomore year. Whew, wow, that's phenomenal. Yeah, he, he was he was an incredible athlete. I mean, he uh, and I'm sure he, from your era. I mean, I'm a little bit older than you. I mean, I'm 58, and I think you're what 47. Man, you're good. Yes, is that right? <laughs> yeah, yeah, I. Uh, he, he, so you know Evan, I'm guessing. Yeah, yeah. We, like I said, the first time I went to Japan, he was there, fought on the same card with him a few times, and just, uh, you know, just knew him through UFC and everything. Always fought on the same cards as him, some, and, you know, worked out with him a few times. Yeah, he was the kind of athlete that he would do his own thing until about four weeks or six weeks before a fight. Yeah. And then he, he looked like he had been training for four or five months for the fight. He was just a, a phenomenal genetic freak. He was a genetic freak, really. Yeah. He was. Oh, yeah. Did, yeah. did you, wait, wait, once, Miguel, I apologize. I'm, I'm going to forget this. But in your recollection with Evan Tanner and Phyllis Lee, did he ever complain about some of the commissions or plane tickets involving her in Japan? Uh, what he did in Japan. <laughs> What he did was, I uh, I think he went out all night with the guys and then got up in the morning and they drove him all the way to the airport. He left his passport in the room. Oh. And, and so he had to go back and get it. Well, Evan was kind of a strange character at the same time. But he was awfully upset that Pancreas charged him for the taxi ride you know, on his next payday. <laughs> so I had to explain to him, they're not paying for two rides, you know, back and forth to the airport. But hey. yeah, that, that was the one complaint I had just the pancreas charged him for, for, for uh, the taxi ride, but it was his fault for leaving his passport in the room. Hey, and let me tell you what, it was like an hour and a half drive to the airport from where they, <laughs> so it was, it was legit yeah. drive, and I can see them being like, "Now we're not paying." Oh, for that. Those were those were at least three hundred dollar uh, uh, taxi rides back and yeah. forth. I, yeah, I remember going there for like for three years in the nineties. That yeah. was that was an expensive deal. People would ask me how much are you getting paid, and I tell them they say that's not enough. But you know, I promoted, so I'd have to explain. You don't understand. They're spending at least five thousand dollars on me between you know hotel and and yep. food and airplane tickets and taxis and and it just goes on and on you know yep. unless, unless you promote you don't see all these extra things that are in there well and, and the thing about pancreas people didn't realize is they paid for their their fight their stable of fighters like they paid for their living they gave a place to eat they play, paid for where they slept i mean so they had a lot of costs you know what i mean and That's you know right. what else there was no place else that was going to pay me that kind of money. You know what I mean? Sure. You're fighting around here in, it, it, in the States, I was getting 500 bucks, you know? So it's like, yeah, they didn't pay great, but they paid better than anybody else. And they spent a lot of money, man. They, they did it right. They treat like a professional. Right. So I liked going there compared to here, to be honest with you. Oh, I did also. I loved going there. I loved going over there. People were great. Even if you lost, which I did quite a bit, they would. <laughs> so. Yeah. Yeah, hey, they respected for you when you lose. <laughs> so. They respected the fighters no matter what, win, lose, or draw. You came out there and fought, and they loved you. And that's, that's what right. I always loved about Japan. Not quite like America. I mean, that's why you have guys if they go out there and they put on a good show, they bring you back no matter what. They had that Bushido fighter spirit. It was great. That's, um, that's that be, exactly right. That, that being said, I do. I, I'd heard some legendary stories about Evan Tanner as far as like going out to Rapongi afterwards and. Ooh, I remember it was with Boss Rudin once, and he was like, you know, Boss was known as a partner. He was like, man, I can't hang with Evan Tanner, that dude. He'd line up five shots to get up. Bam, 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 bam. 
you must play another five shots. Bam, bam, bam. I was like, he must have did 50 shots. I'm like, oh, my God, dude. Yeah, wow. he uh, he he was the toughest one I know that, you know, he the party went to another level when Evan showed up. We'll just put it that way. I mean, we, we were great. We were great friends. We went out a lot together, but I, I don't know that I would want to go out with him if we were out of the country. Oh, yeah. <laughs> <laughs> well, we talk about like with mixed martial arts and how with MMA. It's obviously gone mainstream. Wrestling has seen significant amounts of, you know, additional competitors that they've never seen before. Why do you think Sambo has never really taken off? You know, uh, I'll tell you one of the big problems with it, you know, and, and I know what you're saying. I mean, with these Sambo guys, all the success that they're having in the last few years, you know, that in the uh, UFC with all these, you know, these guys, the Russians and these different guys from these, Soviet states to come and they have success. You would think Sambo would take off with these guys winning, but I'll give you an example. The Sambo nationals is on the 30th of this month. Well, there were like 12 guys from Amarillo that are jujitsu guys, different uh, MMA sports here that wanted to go compete. One guy ordered some clothes for three of them and all the clothes were the wrong size because they had to be made by somebody here in the States. I, I really believe one of the big problems is there's not a, 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 a maker of Sambo supplies here in the United States. I mean, and I, I ordered some stuff just the other day because I thought I'd be maybe doing some clinics on the rules and a little technique for some of these guys before they go to the nationals. And I actually had to get my stuff right from Russia. I ordered some Sambo shoes and some Sambo geese because in the 90s, you could use different kinds of material. And now they have a standard material that they want you to use, which they should, like judo does or jujitsu. But judo and jujitsu, you can order a, a jacket, you know, just like this off the internet. In Sambo, you can't even find the stuff. I had to order my stuff off of eBay, and then it came from Russia. Yeah, um, sure. It's very difficult if you can't to compete in a sport, you can't find the gear. You know, that's wild. I, I'm surprised there's, there's more Sambo tournaments. It's it's just, it's a phenomenal sport. You got all those stands really dominating the UFC right now, all of them with Sambo backgrounds and not a peep. I mean, not, not a single peep in regards to tournaments. It's, and It's an you know. incredible sport, you know, and they're still all wear a T-shirt that says Sambo on it, and they'll say, what's that? And you all tell them to look on you look on YouTube for Sambo highlights or Sambo wrestling, you know, and, and that's about all I can really tell them because it's hard to explain to them you know, what you're talking about. It's it's a fantastic sport, but nobody knows what it is. So, Steve, you're, I mean, so everybody at home can understand. Obviously, you've got a rich history with the mixed martial arts and and pro wrestling. I I think what people really need to understand is just how deep your roots go. Like, you were, at one point, outdrawing the UFC on live events at events that you promoted in Texas. Yes, that's true. Yeah, the uh, Amarillo, Amarillo owned it in the, in the 90s, in the beginning. You know, UFC was having a hard time even getting on pay-per-view. They were getting thrown off of pay-per-view events. And what I did was I sent a video to the Boxing Commission here in Texas of shoot wrestling, which was open-handed, you know, kicking and, I mean, open-handed striking and kicking and all wrestling. And the boxing commission sent me back a letter that said, you don't need a a boxing license. You can do this under a professional wrestling license. So I was in control of the whole shebang. I made, I made my own rules, you know, and I came from a pro wrestling background. So I kind of understood promoting and, and, you know, how to get people in the building. And I, I advertised, which a lot of people have tried to do this with shoot wrestling. I advertised it as real professional wrestling and, You know, from Amarillo, you got guys like Terry Funk and Dory Funk and uh, Dusty Rhodes is actually played football here when he was a kid. Uh, Ted DiBiase, all the (laughs) the famous guys from pro wrestling are from here. You know, so I I just mixed up what I knew, learned growing up. And then I had all that background from Sambo. And and I was in 93 to 95, I was going with the UWFI and they were they had you know, 17,000 people at an event. So what I did was I, I combined the showmanship of UWFI, some of the flair with pancreas, and I just kind of blended it all together in my knowledge of pro wrestling. 
and was able to, you know, put people in the building. I mean, at one evening we had like 5,500 people. Wow. And our, yeah. our, our, our average was 3,500. We had 2,500 the very first show I had. See, now you guys, but you guys were innovators too, though, because like you were among the first group and because you were very independent, like you didn't like follow what anybody did. You were doing your own thing. You, you did rounds and gloves or patties, no, you know. No, we didn't have gloves. We were, we were very similar to pancreas. The rules weren't exactly the same, but that, but they were real close. And what's, strange is hard to believe is right here in Amarillo, you know, I, I had been on a, a UWFI pay-per-view that actually showed here in town. And then I went to uh, the uh, world combat championships and I had a dark match, which isn't seen on TV, but I got it to the news and they showed it on the news, you know, as if it was part of the pay-per-view. So a lot of people had knew who I was and I grew up here wrestling and went to Oklahoma state. So people, this town knew who I was and I was, I was coaching at the high school, so I had a lot to do with the sports page anyway. So when I came to them with my shoot wrestling events, they already trusted me, and so they would put us in the sports page. They would cover our events. And in the 90s, really, to be legitimate, you needed to be in the sports page. So that was real important for us to grow, and it, and it was a sport. But on top of that, what's really incredible is in this town, I had you know myself, which people knew, and then I had Evan Tanner that lived here. Keith Herring that lived here, Paul Jones that lived here. So I had a lot of guys and Frank Trigg started with me here in the USWF. He, he was living in Norman, which is about 300 miles from Amarillo. Uh, Ron Tripp lived in Norman. If you're not familiar with Ron Tripp, he was the only guy that ever beat Hicks and Gracie. And so Ron, he was a judo guy. He beat, him at, beat, beat Hickson and Sambo. And Ron came in here and did a judo match uh, judo exhibition in the very first show I had. Of course, in the 90s, in the very beginning in 96, really nobody even knew who Hicks and Gracie was because they had hoist out there. So, <laughs> you know, in, in 93, for us to, I couldn't even advertise Trip like that because when Trip beat him, I mean, I was there that day. None of us thought the Machados were coming to the Sambo tournaments and, the, and uh, Gracie came. I'm not sure if any of the other Gracies came because the only reason I knew that Hickson was there was because I watched Ron beat him. But I didn't even, we didn't even know that was a big deal at the time until later. Well, wasn't Hickson announced as like 300 and 0? Yeah, well, yeah, he, he's at, he's 301. But okay. at the time, I mean, I could have, yeah, you know, no flag of <laughs> he never lost a pro match, but he never lost an amateur match. But from my understanding, Hickson was counting. Hickson was counting matches in the in his workout room too, to be three hundred and zero. So, the, but to Hickson's credit, to Hickson's credit, and you know, I always like to poke holes, like in in some of the things in regards to to Hickson. In, in round trip, he admits a loss and says, even though it wasn't my rule set, I knew the rules going in, and he he accepts that as his loss. I think that experience might be the reason we never really saw Hickson compete at high, like high level opponents in, in Japan or even the, I mean, obviously never fought in the UFC. Right. Right. Yeah. I'm, I'm not, you know, he never lost a professional match and I don't know if it's because nobody wanted to fight him or what the situation was. I, he was I, pretty picky. He was pretty picky. Right. <laughs> so, I remember, I remember Ron trip from, uh, the American online boards, which is like one of the first places where there was message boards and stuff where you could talk about UFC. And he used to discuss that. You said you were at that match. Why don't you take us through your memory of it, if you could? There wasn't much to it. Uh, if you've done any judo, it's a, it's a throw called Uchimata, and Ron just hit him with Uchimata. And in, in Sambo, it's called Total Victory. If I throw you from your feet to your back, flat to your back, and I don't fall down, the match is over. It's like an e-pawn in judo. In judo, I can throw you and fall with you, but in, in sambo, I have to throw you to your back, and I, I have to continue standing. And Ron hit him with Uchimata. He didn't go down with him, and Gracie landed flat, and the match was over. I mean, it, it, the match never even got started, really. You know, it would be not – it would be more to Ron's credit had Ron been able to submit him, 
but that's not what happened. Ron beat him with a total victory throw. Now, so so wow. he beat him in judo or style. It wasn't in like a grappling match, so that's probably why that throw was still there. I would imagine. Well, uh, Gracie Hickson had set claimed to be like a two-time Pan American champion in Sambo. He knew the rules. Okay. He, so, I mean, it. But according to him, he never lost a match in anything except to Ron Tripp. Yeah, yeah Chris. Okay. Chris, if if I may play devil's advocate, with the three and four hundred, I think it was actually four hundred and zero, not three hundred zero. I think I may have underestimated or understated that. Um, I have a feeling that he counted even bowling matches in there. Yeah. So, yeah, and that one should stand some wrestling. <laughs> yeah, I'm not sure how they do that. That you know, because I know in amateur wrestling, I must have had two thousand matches. So, you know, so I don't, I don't think that having three hundred or four hundred matches in, is impossible. But uh, from my understanding, they also count practice matches. Which, man, if I counted my practice matches, I mean, my my record would be terrible. I mean, worse than it already is. Yeah, I'm gonna say there's, there's not gonna be an O in there. No. So, Steve, we, you talk about your before, before we get to your MMA stuff. Miguel, would you mind if I do a pro wrestling question? Oh, sure, of course. Okay. All right. So, in 1993, and we're gonna get to the MMA stuff in a minute. Sakuraba's pro wrestling debut is against that of yourself. Yes. How did that get lined up? Well. You know, I don't really know that UWFI would, they wouldn't tell you who you're wrestling before you come over there. You just, you just come. I mean, and I didn't even have, they didn't even have contracts that they would send you. They would just say, Hey, do you want to wrestle on this date and time? And, and you would go, I, I went to a tryout in Tennessee and uh, there was a guy named Gene Lydic, who was a star for the UWFI and a guy named Kaki Hara, who was a star for them. And, these guys were at the tryouts and a guy named Billy Robinson was the coach of the tryout. And then they had an agent from Japan that came and then he would pick guys that he wanted to go. And after the first day of tryouts, they had us do like 300 squats the very first day. Some of the guys just hit the road because they couldn't, they could they couldn't walk after that. And yeah. so they, you know, after we did these exercises, then we would start wrestling because they wanted to see how well you wrestled and submission wrestled. And, uh, you know, I, I came from a background of, with my dad who would do like 500 squats, even at 68 years old and Carl Gotch, I had trained with Carl Gotch in 1990. So I already knew the Japanese way was to kill guys with squats. So I was prepared before I went to the tryout, but, but when I went, I went over there and Sakuraba was my first match. Now, I, I asked you, to, can you answer on the camera, that, did you feel him as being special? Was there anything there that alerted you? And how did well, they it treat him? It was kind of like the, uh, the Gracies. I mean, that was, it was 1993, say, when Ron Tripp wrestled Hicks and Gracie. We didn't know who he was. You know, in 1993, Sakuraba was young. I, I think, I believe I was 29 and Sakuraba might have been six or seven years younger than me. So mm, he, was wow. just, he was just out of college wrestling. And his college coach was an Olympic champion. So he had a he had a great coach. But no one knew who anyone was, especially me, because I was brand new to it. I did some pro wrestling, regular pro wrestling. And then I went to UWFI to do shoot wrestling, pro wrestling. So I didn't know any of these guys till I got there. I knew who Ber I knew who Gary Albright was because uh, he wrestled for Nebraska, and, and we were like the same age. So I knew who he was. So with your promotion, you mixed at times like shoot wrestling or like pro wrestling and like sometimes on the same card you would have it, much like Japan. Am I correct? Yeah, I'm not going to let you in the back door of everything here, but yeah, you're yeah, I I mixed pro wrestling with shoot wrestling to a certain extent. Yes. Okay. Now you also you, like in your work, I checked on this. You were doing like women's matches, like there were women's matches or in like at least 1999 there was a couple matches that you had that I saw. You know, talk talk about that type of uh, activity back in the 90s. I had the first women's match back in 19, uh, 
it was we started not, I think my first women's match was in 1997 on I oh. believe it was USWF four. And uh I I had some girls that were interested. One was actually just strictly a pro wrestler that wanted to do it. Then I had a girl that was a Taekwondo girl and uh, I just put these two together and uh, they just had one incredible entertaining match. And uh, the girl that from the Taekwondo, her name was Lisa Hunt. She actually started training with us, with us guys. And uh, there was a girl named uh, Dianya Bieria who was on like the national judo team. And she, she was also a wrestler too, and she they they were at, they matched up against each other. Dionya was a lot smaller, but they were my first title match for a girl. And uh, Dionya shot in with a double leg, and we had coached Lisa. You know these people are going to shoot in on you. Grab them in the front choke, and you know lock your legs around them, and and that happened. And Lisa was able to get a win over somebody with an e- enormous reputation from the Olympic Training Center. Cool. Now you mentioned yeah, Lisa Hunt. Am I correct? What's that? You said Lisa Hunt was Lisa her name? Hunt. Lisa Hunt, yes. So your last USWF show was like number 16. That was your last promoted show. I owned it all the way through 18. Evan Tanner promoted 17 and 18, but it, it just it just didn't work out for him to where he was going to be able to keep promoting. So I took the company back, and then Lisa Hunt actually – she bought it uh, right and she she then she had a couple of shows and it just didn't work out for her so that's where the company ended all right so the uswf so people at home understand it was a staple in the beginning martial arts world like we talk about hook and shoot about just you know what an incredible organization rightfully so you guys predated hook and shoot and some of the talent that you had on those cards is insane like eve edwards you had Guy Metzger, I think, fought for you. Evan Tanner. No, I, I didn't have Metzger. No. You didn't have Metzger? No. You had Don, just... Don Fry. Had Don Fry. Fry. Okay. Don Fry. Oh, yeah, I had Don Fry. I had Carlo Prater, who was getting his start with us. Frank Trigg. Oh. Uh, Heath Herring. Uh, you know, and, and Dan, Dan came around in USW, USWF 2 after I had the first one. And we had to move to a bigger building. We sold out this, this soccer arena, and then we had to move over to the rodeo arena to have the next one. And, and when D- Dan had just won the ultimate ultimate, and so he was a big name in, and that's when they were having trouble having UFC on pay-per-view. They were even having a hard time getting it on there with all the politicians messing with it. And so for if you wanted to see live fighting or fighting at all pretty much in Amarillo, they, they had to come to ours. So, you know, because in the beginning, I was real worried that open hand fighting wouldn't even make it. You know, I, I didn't know if people would like that or not. It just took off. Yeah, yeah. huge. Yeah, so let's talk about your first fight. Um, October 17th, 1995, World Combat Championships. Ethan Andrews, how do you get invited to that event? The event? How, who were you training with leading up to it? Uh, I, well, I was at school. I was coaching and teaching at that time. Uh, and there's a lot of people in Amarillo, like Paul Jones, and he's also another high school wrestling coach here in town. So I had him and Tanner and all these guys, another guy named Ali Elias, who fought for me and fought in Japan. He, he was from Amarillo. He was another coach. He was a freestyle world champion from Iran, and he was coaching here in Amarillo. That was another guy I had that was shoot wrestling for me. So I had guys to train with and, uh, the Phyllis, I went, Dan Severin gave me Phyllis Lee's phone number and I called her. And then she, next thing I know, she calls me back and says, you're going to be fighting in, I think it was North Carolina. And I was fighting Ethan Andrews. And I didn't even really know who I was fighting for that either. I just knew I was supposed to show up. <laughs> okay. Did, quick question. Did you know the rules back then? Because one thing I love about the old school, you, a lot of times you didn't know until you got there and they changed them. Like you can't headbutt. Can't need that. You just never really knew the rules fully until you got there. Well, it was, they still, at that event, they had the same old UFC rules that just no uh, eye gouging and no biting. Everything, <laughs> yeah, everything else was a go. You could grab the cage, you know, you could, you could headbutt, you could do whatever you want. So the, it was easy to remember the rules because there was only yeah. a couple of them. And yeah, uh, that's, that's the famous, that's the famous, uh, uh, 
James Waring, uh, uh, Eric Paulson match with the hair pulling was on that show. That was the boxer, right? Yeah, yeah. The, the boxer and and yes, I, yeah, I, yeah, because Eric and I have talked and and I didn't know Eric when I went there either, and and that was Eric's also first fight, you know, in the cage that day, and mine also, you know, so that kind of got a lot. Of, there was, you know, besides UFC, there was not a lot going on back then. You, you know, you had some pancreas and then, you know, you had the shoot wrestling, UWFI shoot wrestling. And, and in the eighties, you had the UWF shoot wrestling, which was, you know, it is what it is. And that was, you know, that was before the UWFI, you know, so that all this stuff was going on, but real fighting and real shoot wrestling, it, there wasn't a lot. So to get in an event, you were pretty lucky back then. Well, what did you think going into your first fight? I mean, was it getting ready, like, for the walkout? Were you thinking, the hell am I getting myself into? There's no rules here, literally. I mean, it was uh, – people yeah. People used to look at you like you were nuts when you did it, you know. But I, how were you feeling going into that first fight? Well, I, you know, for some reason I wasn't real nervous. And, and uh, Dan Severn flew in to be with me, be in my corner that day. Cool. And uh, – you know, I, I felt pretty good. And I had a buddy with me from Amarillo that he never wrestled or nothing. And, and he, he asked me the same thing. He said, aren't you nervous? And I said, you know, I said, I've wrestled my whole life. I said, to me, this is another match, except you get to punch and kick, you know? So it, it, it really wasn't a whole lot different to me, except I got to, you know, I got to hit him is what I felt like at the time. Yeah. But, you know, I didn't know what I was getting into. You know, I, uh, yeah. I, even in that match, I almost got triangled. I mean, I, and I should have known better because I watched it happen to Dan with Gracie, you know, and uh, and I almost got myself caught in a triangle. And while I was in it, I really wasn't even realizing what was happening to me at the time. And and he, and he, he could have won that match, actually. But uh, lucky enough, I, you know, I was able to lean on his throat a little bit and got out. Now, that was a that's a show like when you rate those old time shows. That is one of the most violent shows tough. of all time. I mean, that is, do you re, do you remember seeing it? Because like you would have been one of the first matches out. You know, I, you I was the, match, and and then the rest of the night develops. How how was that experience for you? Yeah, I was the very first match of the night because I was a dark right. match, and then uh, if somebody got hurt, I was going to get to move in, and uh, I I think it was. I can't even remember. They moved in another kid that fought after me that, to move move somebody in. But, yeah. uh, yeah, I mean, it was, you know, it was exciting, you know, it, it really was. I mean, it, but I, at, even at that time though, I didn't, I didn't know I was going to start my own company. I didn't know I was going to do any of those things. It just, after I had fought, uh, Half Gracie in Canada, I got beat up and TKO'd in about 44 seconds. I, uh, fought him over there in 96. And then to be honest with you, I really started thinking, you know, anytime you lose, you want a rematch. The loser always wants a rematch. But when you get beat up in 44 seconds, you're not going to get one. And it was always going <laughs> through my mind when that happened. You know, for me to get a rematch, I'm probably going to have to start my own deal just to get make this happen. And uh, that's actually, you know, how it got started. I was thinking if I could get this going, I could romance Gracie into coming and doing a match here. And, uh, wow. you know, unfortunately, I got whipped twice. But... <laughs> Yeah, but I got my rematch in the end. So, but well, here was, we're, we're, just, we're just Steve. If you don't mind, we we try to go a little bit of order. You're fantastic stuff. Let, let me just kind of rewind just a little bit and bring up Half Gracie again. So that's actually that's your second fight. You you beat your, uh, Ethan Andrews, knocked him out two minutes forty five seconds, and then August 26, nineteen ninety six, you fly up to Canada Extreme Fighting Two against Half Gracie. Now, John Peretti's the matchmaker for both of those events. And for those of you at home, we actually interviewed, um, uh, what's his name? Come on, the, the, the Waring's opponent. I, I, why am I drawing a blank? Oh, Eric Paulson. Eric Paulson. Jesus Christ. Eric Paulson, it, it is one of the most savagely just brutal things to watch. It, it's on YouTube. It'll make you throw up watching Waring just constantly just tear at the the scalp and hair of Eric Paulson. Like it is, it, it's unsettling. Like it, it's, it's, it's sick to watch, but and extreme to fighting to plug our interview with, with Eric too. But Eric says, cause, cause of, of the hair pulling and he's trying to get his hair for, it was this part of his body that hurt for weeks. 
like his neck <laughs> and just trying to get his head away from the guy. So, and, and, and hearing him share that experience 20 something years later, it's just unbelievable. Man. Yeah. It's, <laughs> it's, unbelievable. it's very disturbing. So there's, there's a lot of funny things that happened in the beginning. I, I, cause I remember guy Mesger and the, another guy fighting in UFC and they made an agreement between each other where we don't pull each other's hair. I haven't thought about that in a long time until you started talking about that. I don't know yeah, if you guys remember that. Well, yeah, my Jason hair's like Fair. That's Jason <laughs> Farron, uh, who who actually uh, rest in peace for Jason Farron. But uh, but yeah, that's the that's that's the other hair pulling match. There there were two that led to the rule obviously being officially made. It, that it's was disturbing. Chemo and then, uh, wearing one. Waring was a little bit of a bad boy though, because he was a cruiserweight like champion in boxing and stuff. But there were he made a couple of appearances in MMA where, you know, he was he was there to win. He was there to win at all costs. And the rules, you know, he he was glad there were a few of them. But anyway, Mike, I hijacked <laughs> you go. Right. Yeah. So it's your second bout. It's not a sport you want to do for free. Though, though in the 90s, you'd fought a lot of times for not much money or even wrestled a lot for not much money back then. Yeah, a- absolutely. Um, your second fight, April 26, 1996, Extreme Fighting 2 against Half Gracie. You had mentioned that uh, it was a 44-second loss, but what you didn't talk about was, did you get arrested at that show? <laughs> yeah, I did get arrested. I they came right into my room. They got the keys from the desk and came in and got me. They sure Why? they well, this is another thing. I and I never knew nothing about nothing back then. I had no idea that we were moving arenas, that we were breaking any laws. I mean, I didn't know anything about none of these things. And we had even moved hotels, which I didn't understand why. And then come to find out fist fighting is illegal in, in Canada at the time. And so the Indian nation said, you guys can come fight on our nation. We have our own laws. Well, then we had the fights that night. And when we left, we went back to the hotel. So they came into the rooms and got everybody they could. They had like seven of us and kept us in jail for like, I think it was only two days, but. But, uh, but yeah, that we we had no idea you know, what was going on. At least I didn't. Man, was sounds like Justin Trudeau was in charge way back then, just taking people's rights away. I guess. Uh. <laughs> I think, yeah, that, I think that's France, right? <laughs> that's but, weird. But see, that's gotta be like you said. You know, you come from a wrestling background. You know, Oklahoma State. You've got thousands of competitions. To you, I, I, and I've met, you know, Dan Severn, Roy Salger is another guy that comes to mind of that, that wrestling mindset, you know, of like it's competition and, and be hard headed about it. So you go up there like that. Now you're in jail. Like you're actually, you said two days, you actually slept in jail. Like, oh, yeah. how did you call yeah. your wife to like talk about what that, your mindset? Well, I, I, I didn't get married till I was 45. So I didn't have a wife back. And I, I actually had my girlfriend with me. And uh, so she had to basically watch them put me into the car and take me off. Yeah. <laughs> so it, Bad I, boy. It was a rough start, right there. rough start to a rough career is what that was. And what did they do to you? To, like, did you pay a lawyer? You the company that no, uh, that deal was like they were owned or sponsored by Penthouse somehow and Peretti and them. I mean, they, they got us out and they paid for everything and, uh, to the best of my knowledge, I mean, we were found n- not guilty, I guess, or they paid a <laughs> fine for us all. I mean, I, uh, I, I, I was 91 was, I don't know, I've been back to Canada, so I'm not sure I'm okay. With <laughs> I was going to say, if you've been back to Canada, you might have a warrant out for your arrest right yeah, now. Yeah, so. no, I, I haven't been there since 96, so I'm not sure. <laughs> oh, boy. <laughs> you know, in the MMA game, there's Oftentimes, where there's just a weird set of circumstances that happens where uncomfortable conversations have to take place with the promoter, that's a really hard one to have when your entire lineup from top to bottom get ar- gets arrested for doing what it is they were paid to do. That's, yeah. that's a hard conversation. Well, yeah, and like uh, that night, Paul, Paul Jones was there fighting also from Amarillo, and he had a for some reason his guy couldn't fight, he had a Paul got a forfeit that night. I don't know what the deal was. He got his money, got his hand raised, 
but they didn't arrest Paul because they said Paul didn't fight. So they weren't interested in him. Only the guys that fought and Gracie wasn't in his room when they came. So no one knew where Half was. Half was you know, running around and staying out of the way. So oh. there were about seven of us that went and Peretti was one of them. He got arrest for being the, for being the promoter. Sometimes it pays to go out and party all night. That's why I was there was because I didn't want to get arrested, just in case. You know? <laughs> Let that be a lesson to you, young kids. You had a good plan. <laughs> Steve, you mentioned Peretti. Peretti, you know, falls into that legendary category from that time period as a matchmaker, later match made in the UFC. How did he present Ralph Gracie to you? you you didn't know who Hinson was. Was Ralph also like a great unknown, or was he telling you this is, you know, the, did, did the le- had the legend filled in a little bit for you? How, how was all that? Well, I, I had already seen Hal fight for those guys on some other their okay. pay per views they had already done before that one. I don't even know which one that was, whether it was the second or the third. But uh, how I'd already saw Hal fight for him, but he, you know, he only fought for a minute or two every time I saw him, and uh, so that well, that was actually that was that was actually a title match. Between me and him. Steve, at this point, Health had not seen the two-minute mark in a fight. He had about six or seven pounds. Right, right. So Health was highly regarded as somebody maybe pound for pound one of the best in the world. Yeah. And Steve, and, and, but, but, but at this point, his, his personality comes through when he's matchmaking. Did you get the feeling that he wanted Ralph to win, or did he, like, send you in there feeling confident? Like, what was Peretti's – dealings with you that's kind of like my curiosity no nah, there was really no uh talking me into it he just said do you want to you know when that came along you know i had already had that fight at world combat and i was second at the world championships in sambo in 91 and in 94 so you know back then you got you got big matches and on tv just off your amateur record so it wasn't like now where you know you have to you should have a good amateur background you need to fight for some other shows you know, working like LFA and these kind of things, working your way into the year, the big show back then, you know, they were just going off a guy's amateur record and sticking you in. So getting the match was easy. And he said, you know, do you want to fight how for the first uh, extreme championship or battle cage championship, whatever it was called back then. And of course I said, sure. You know, cause I, you know, I, I, that was fine with me. I mean, he didn't have to talk me into it. It was nothing like that. Okay. Well, now, as far as training back then, were you basically just wrestling and doing some sambo shooting? Were you doing any stand-up, like boxing, kickboxing or anything? No. It, the place where me and uh, Tanner and Paul Jones and uh, Ollie Elias, where we worked out was, uh, it was it's called the Maverick Boys Club. They had a small wrestling room. And the only thing they had for punching up there was one was one bag. And that was it. And uh, and so we would kick on that a little bit. But almost all of our workouts back then were just working, wrestling, submissions, that kind of thing. We uh, we almost never. I I had a friend named Juan Martinez that was a boxer that I boxed with him a little bit, but it it didn't do me a whole lot of good because I was getting knocked down most of the time, you know. But uh, I uh, but no, we didn't. All of us guys, you know, Tanner's got that reputation of. He was self-trained. Well, we all were back then. You know, yeah. we, we, you know, I had a judo coach. And, you know, when I was in Oklahoma, when I left Oklahoma State, I was in Norman. And my judo coach was a two-time Olympian in judo. I mean, so I – I, I, we were all kind of self-trained for MMA, but we all had coaching from somebody, you know. So I don't – none of us were totally self-trained from nothing, I don't think. Okay. You know, but – but yeah, no, none of us were doing any kickboxing. Uh, Tanner actually moved off from Amarillo and went to like Coacher's place in Nevada. And uh, he, he went to a few different places, I think. He didn't stick around in one place too long. And uh, so he started doing his kickboxing and some boxing. But uh, all of us, our, all of our experience was in grappling. That's what we did. And we didn't do much at all of any kind of striking. Of course, and that hurt us, you know, but in the nineties, a lot of it was striker versus grappler and yeah. that kind of thing. There was one, one you had one style usually, like he's a wrestler, he's a jiu-jitsu guy, kickboxer. Uh, Nobody was cross training, doing everything. Yeah, and you know, in fighting half, you know, he was a jujitsu guy, so worrying about striking, it really wasn't there. 
you know. <laughs> so professional athletes, whenever they do sports in the state of Texas, they have a, like a sit down with them and explain to them that there's a lot more temptation here than in, say, in some of the northern states. And a lot of it has to deal with like the Mexican cartel and the mafia and the cocaine and drugs and things of that nature, because it's much more prevalent, particularly along border towns than it is the rest of the country. When you were doing the, the USWF, did you have any issues or interaction with that type of activity? No, no. Never even approached, huh? No, never approached. Uh, you know, I used to hear about people money laundering and all those kinds of things. And, you know, in the 90s, I wasn't smart about any of that either. You know, I, I, I'll be honest with you. I didn't even start watching the news until I was about 40. You know, I was... I was more about going and having fun and hanging out and, you know, and I, all the serious stuff just didn't cross my mind. So those things that were going on in the eighties and nineties, I never even thought of. And, and, but since you mentioned it, you know, I'm surprised I wasn't approached because being a promoter of, of a sport that's paid with a lot of cash coming in the front door, you know, you could a guy could be hit up for those kind of activities, but no, I never was. Now, you also did, you you did do some pro wrestling in Mexico City, though, in like 89, I think it goes back. You, so you were a young, young man. How, did you see the wild side of Mexico there at all? You know, because the, 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 the Mexican pro wrestling scene could be wild. Yeah, yeah. I I, uh, I went over there in the 80s and I went by myself. And uh, <laughs> yeah, I, uh, I there was a, a wrestler named Ricky Romero here in town and in the 80s, I don't know, you're, Chris, you were kind of young. I, I don't know if you other guys remember, but in the 80s, to be to get promoted in the 80s, you had to be a monster. I mean, that was the days of Andre the Giant and Big John Studd, and all these guys were monsters. So there was no place for me in pro wrestling, except this guy said, in Mexico, they have weight divisions like amateur wrestling. He said, you would be perfect over there. So... We, we drove from Amarillo to Juarez. We went to the wrestling matches. He introduced me to the promoter, uh, got me some phone numbers from Mexico City. He made some calls, and the next thing you know, I'm in, I'm in Mexico City doing pro wrestling. And I had only had a few, like maybe five matches here in Texas before I went to Mexico. So I had a lot to learn. I didn't know anything, what I was doing there either. You know, so <laughs> I, did a lot of, I did a lot of learning in 1989 in Mexico. But uh, – I'll tell you a funny story. My, my father was working. You ask how I got started in the MMA business. The truth is in 1984, this guy named Eddie Graham, who was the promoter of Florida championship wrestling that made Dusty Rhodes and a lot of these guys as big as they were. Sure. Super there was this guy, yeah. There was a guy that was a sheriff and he wanted to be a pro wrestler. Eddie Graham asked me, would you rough this guy up? And because I don't want him to be a pro wrestler. He said, I don't want him to work for me. I'm a friend of his father's. So, so I don't know anything. I could have lost my eligibility for wrestling at Oklahoma state at the time, because I was still in college. So I show up at the arena, I've got my stuff. And they tell this guy, if you can beat this guy, they said, we'll let you be a pro wrestler here in Florida. So actually that was my first shoot wrestling match. And this guy, this guy goes to the ring in a mask because he didn't, he was the sheriff. He didn't want anybody to know who he was. So, <laughs> yeah, so, so I'm standing across from this guy and I, I rough him up and pop him a little bit. I never punched him or kicked him in the head or nothing and, and put him down and choked him till he tapped so the match would be over. But that really was my first match in MMA. But that, but that there's no, that's kind of unheard of. I mean, my, my father used to do some of that for the promoter, but since I was there, I guess he had me do it. You know, so that was really my first taste of getting in the getting in the ring and actually doing something on a competitive level. Yeah, that's awesome. That's just awesome. So, by um, and I didn't get paid for it, so it didn't hurt my eligibility. <laughs> let me throw that out there. That's good. Even better. Yeah. yeah, yeah. I don't want the NCAA calling Oklahoma State forty years later and saying something about it. <laughs> Be careful. So by USWF 5, 6, and 7, you start bringing in talent from Japan. Yes. Right. 
You brought in Hideki Nakai, who you fought, as well as Tiachi Hayashi, both of your opponents. What was the reason for kind of building that bridge in your mind to bring in this, these, the Asian talent? I, I didn't bring in very many people. And Tayashi Ty- Hayashi was actually from El Paso. But okay. he, yeah, he actually was, his father was Japanese. He lived in El Paso. But uh, Jutero Nakai, I mean, not Jutero Nakai, I fought him in Japan. Uh, Haneki Nakai, yeah, that was USWF 5. He was actually training in Oklahoma for a judo championship. So I didn't have to pay for his plane ticket or anything. And Ron Tripp told me about this guy. And he said, this guy only weighs like 155 pounds. And I was weighing 170. And I said, well, ask him if he wants to fight. You know, and but he came to the ring in a gi, you know, and I was, you know, I was well versed with the gi from all the judo and the sambo and all that. So that was kind of a bad move on his part. But yeah, I was pretty smart about who I brought in and how I promoted, you know, who I was bringing. I promoted Hideki Nakai as being undefeated, and he was undefeated because he was zero and zero. You know, so, that's, so that's how I promoted him. <laughs> You know, and the internet was so new. You know, the internet was real new back in 19, you know, the 90s, 95, 97. So it was kind of hard to look people up back then. Well, that's a brilliant move, though, is, you know, you're getting local talent with the Japanese name. They, they're, you can market them as a Japanese fighter. You said at this point, your goal is to get Ralph's attention again. You need to knock some wins. So this sounds right, like right. You're, and uh, you're, you're doing the pro wrestling thing, build it. Yeah, and, and because we were under a professional wrestling license, I could pretty much do and say what I wanted, you know, to, to get the program going, you know. Uh, but I did do some stuff like this. Like, I would have an eight-man tournament, and the winner of that eight-man tournament would get to fight the champion, say, on the next show. These were some of the things I did, though, to make the – so the crowd would understand who's going to get to wrestle the champion and all that kind of stuff. You know, next, I, I wish I wish UFC would do a little more of that where they would have a tournament, you know, going through the year. And, and you know, we would know who's going to fight the champion next, even if it's just a, a four man tournament, you know, so that we're not picking and grabbing who's going to fight the champion all the time. You know, the, I would like for the people to get to know who's earning their position, you know, and if, if somebody is if, kind of like amateur wrestling, if you get hurt and you have to forfeit. Well, then you just, you just, that guy that's not forfeit and he moves on, you know, because it's, you know, that's just some of that. I would like to see a little more of that. <clears throat> you know, cause I, but I would like for everyone to know that the challenger's not just getting picked, picked by the promoter and put in there, you know, but nobody asked me. So I'm just giving you guys my opinion about <laughs> that, you know? Yeah. No, yeah. but it makes sense. And, you know, tells the story book too. So. Yeah, yeah. I mean, you you could have a four man guy, the top four guys, or or an eight man tournament, and work that f- through a few shows because they have a show every Saturday. You know, you could do one. Of, these guys could fight every third or fourth week till they get to see who they're who's going to fight the champ. You know, and that way the public would understand how they're getting their title shot. Also, yeah, yeah it tells the story. Yes, yeah, for sure, for sure. November 29th, nineteen ninety seven, Valley Tudo Japan. King of Triangle, Jutaro, Jutaro Nakao. This, this man at the time had, he had a, uh, Shinya Ayaki, his first loss. He knocked him out and he triangled Pet Militic. Um, wow. He's one of the top three in the world at the moment that this, this fight took place. So you weren't shying away from stiff competition, that's for sure. No, with those, that Valley Tudo had nine minute rounds and the first we went the first nine minutes and then this, and then he got me in about five minutes into the second round he caught me with the triangle and uh, I forget exactly what happened I took him down two or three times and then on the last takedown we went into the ropes and they pulled us back to the middle and as soon as he said go he slapped the triangle on me that I mean it was so tight I couldn't believe how tight it was I mean I I would have liked to have picked him up and thrown him over the top rope but I. I, I couldn't get this guy from my neck. I mean, I was going to go out had I not tapped. I mean, he 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 had that triangle down to a fine arc. Yeah, yeah, that's fantastic. Um, and how was your experience in Japan? Did you uh, notice any issues in the locker room? 
Did they approach you with any nefarious deals that may they may have wanted? No, no. They Japan was great to me. I mean, it was between there and you know wrestling for UWFI. I loved that. Uh, I went over to Shudo to fight with uh, Jaturo. You know, it, both of them treated us great. The the Ballet Tudo was actually held at at, at Disneyland. So, you know, we were at Disneyland the whole time in the hotel and everybody was wonderful. I mean, they were great. I mean, I, I got to know a lot of the Japanese because the reporters would come here to the USWF shows and they really enjoyed themselves. And I would have them stay an extra day and I would take them like to the lake, which is about 60 miles from here. And all my friends that had boats, they would take all the out of town fighters and we would go to the lake and do all have a lot of fun and they could interview the fighters, and then the next day that we would get back. The next day they'd go back to Japan. So, and, and, and my, cool. you know, Levi's was a big deal to them. So my mother would go and buy these guys Levi's. They thought that was the greatest thing in the world. <laughs> <laughs> did you um, did you go out to Rapungi when you were in Japan? No, I when I was in Japan, I never went out and drank a beer one time. I never did. I. Uh, I always needed my money. So I, when I was going, it was about $9 a beer, I think. So, oh. I, yeah, so I would always, I kept my money and, and just went back to my room and got up in the morning. But, hey, I, I never forgot my passport. I always had it with me. <laughs> <laughs> That's fantastic. So by USWF 11, September 1st, 1998, Health Gracie rematch. How difficult was it to get Health Gracie in your organization, with your judges, in your hometown, what did that cost you? Uh, well, it cost me the amount of the match, which was it was twenty thousand dollars winner take all. Oh, yeah the uh, the uh, I had he wanted to bring four guys with him, you know. So it was hotel room. I had two or three hotel rooms for those guys for a few days. Plane tickets for four guys, you oh. know. Yeah. The cost of the match. Uh, from Brazil or from Florida? Uh, he was living here in the States. He wasn't coming in from Brazil. I don't remember where he was living. He was in Florida. Yeah, like Port Orange or something like that. I think he was in Port Orange, Florida at that point, though. I'm, I, 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 I read that somewhere. Yeah, I'll be honest with you. I can't even remember. Hmm. Yeah, it, it, I remember that twenty thousand dollar challenge. I remember that in like in full contact fighter put you know twenty thousand dollar challenge. You put the marketing was behind that. That number was public. You made that number public. It was very good money for a single match. Yeah, sure, sure it was. Yeah, because it, it back then it was costing me about uh, twenty thousand dollars to even have a show. So he was really a, another. If I lost, it was another, which I did. It was another twenty thousand on top of, you know, on top of the uh, the whole thing. So, but it it actually turned out okay because the fight. The reporters were there from Japan, but the the fight was I, not that it was a great fight to me, but it was such a good fight that uh, Samurai TV gave me twenty thousand dollars to let them put that match on in Japan. So Samurai, wow. T so Samurai TV actually ended up paying his fee. So it turned out okay. Oh, I'm glad to hear that, actually. Hear that. Yeah. How's that fight end up playing out? Do you remember how it played out exactly? With the, the fight? Yeah. Yeah, I, think yeah, I uh, which I'm still ashamed of because I still can't believe I let it happen. He, he took me down uh, two or three times in the beginning and then uh, – I got away from him, and and the third. Did you get dropped in the first exchange too? What's that? Did you get dropped in the first exchange? Yeah, he actually came out there and hit me, kicked me in the leg, and hit me with a closed fist. And uh, you know the rules were open handed in, in that fight, but it didn't mean much to him, I guess. But uh, yeah, it it dropped it dropped me. I caught myself on the rope. I still remember that. I caught myself on the rope and came up, and then the referee just said, you know, start fighting again. <laughs> but uh, and he and he took me down two or three times. I can't. I honestly I can't remember. But the last time, and I he I let him get me locked up and bear hugged again. And he was about to step behind me and take me down for number three or number four. Which being a wrestler, that's kind of humiliating. Yeah. But he actually, when he started, he slipped and he fell on his back. So for the next uh, eight or nine minutes. 
I controlled him and mounted him and, and uh, you know, struck him and this and that. And then at the very end, he caught me in an arm bar. I, I remember uh, I was winning. I, I felt like I was winning so easily. I remember relaxing, which was the mistake. You know, I, I really should have kept my elbows in tight, but I was, I was reaching up and reaching out and I ended up getting caught in an arm lock. I mean, he, he had me in a nice tight arm lock. He did a good job with that. So for everybody at home, I'd say Steve lost probably the first two and a half, maybe three minutes of the fight. And then for the next 10 minutes and 15 seconds, it was incredibly one-sided with multiple mounts by Steve. And then with like a minute 45 left, health hits an arm bar. Mm. Yeah, and, and there were, if it, had it went all the way, there my matches were – our my company was 15 minutes and then a five-minute overtime if, if there was no uh, no winner. So there would have been a five-minute overtime had the bell rang, you know, if it would have went that far. <laughs> you know. How was Ralph to deal with? Like in the whole bringing him in and his people, yeah, that's difficult. But did he do anything crazy at the event or were the weigh-ins tense? Because he's like – He's one of those guys that lives on the edge, I think. You know, he's tense. <laughs> yeah, he, uh, I, he, at first he wasn't at the weigh-in. And uh, so I had my vice president, his name was Felix Rios, who he was, an, he, he was my partner in crime on this deal. I, I was the face of the company, but he helped me out. and He actually helped talk me in to go ahead and doing it. But uh, Felix got on the phone and called house manager who was with him and said, hey, where are you guys at? And they said, why do we got to weigh in? And uh, Felix said, because it's in your contract. He said, you got to come make weight. And they said, well, what's the weight? <laughs> so, you know, and uh, the weight vision was 170. And when I fought Half in uh, extreme fighting, we fought at 155. So he, he wasn't a house, not a big guy. He weighed right at 170, 168. That was his natural weight. You know, luckily, uh, luckily he wasn't one of these guys that just weighed 190 naturally because I couldn't have called the show off. You know, yeah. if, he would have weighed one, if I would have known he didn't think there was a way in, you know, I would have been 190 or 200 going into the thing. But uh, I didn't know he didn't think there was a way in. Yeah, that's a shame. <laughs> yeah, if there was no way in, you'd have been smooth sailing, man. It would have been better for you. <laughs> Yeah, How much you pay? Twenty thousand. Yeah, why do we got to weigh in? And my my vice president Felix said because there's a, it's in his contract. You know, you guys got to weigh one seventy. Yeah. <laughs> so, which is wow. that that alone was kind of strange to me, but you know, it, it is what it is. And he, he and he weighed in and made weight and still won, so he did fine. Yeah, <laughs> can't knock him for that. No, for sure. Right, that's right. Well, you had mentioned John Preddy earlier in this interview. How was your relationship with him? Uh, you know, I, I didn't have a, a bad relationship with him. I mean, I, I went to extreme fighting and I lost. And so I wasn't planning on working for him anymore anyway. And then he ended up moving over to UFC. And I'm not sure what happened with Evan and, and Phyllis, but Evan Phyllis wasn't managing Evan anymore. And so I was making all of his calls for him. I was, you know, him and Paul and uh, Ali and all these guys that went to Japan, these different places. I, I did all that stuff for free for him. I didn't charge him anything. And Preddy calls me one day and he's screaming and yelling about Evan because Evan's not using Phyllis Lee to, uh, to uh, be his manager. And I told him, I said, I got nothing to do with that. And he starts yelling about, well, if you're managing for free, of course, he's not going to use Phyllis. You know, and I told, you know, and I didn't want to get in this big argument with him. You know, I, I wasn't going to work for John, so I could have hung up on him. But I also had Paul Jones, who was fighting in the UFC. You know, I had these guys in the UFC, so I didn't want Peretti to not let these guys fight. So I didn't say too much. I just told him I would talk to Evan and, and nothing ever changed. He never had <laughs> I, Evan never had Phyllis manage him again, and, and he still fought in the UFC. So I don't, I don't know what the use was of him calling and being mad at me about Evan. You know, he, but I, he but was, I was mad. Getting, I was getting he the was, blame for Evan not using Phyllis. Is what happened. So he was mad that Evan wasn't paying his manager percentage to Phyllis Lee, 
who then in turn probably bought multiple dinners for or, or sent money to people like John Peretti. <laughs> Yeah, I, I'm not exactly sure what was going on, but what's in his business if he's not paying a percentage? Like it shouldn't even come out of his mouth. Yeah, yeah. He but he was upset with me that I was doing it for free. But yeah, for free. Phyllis, yeah. And that was, you know, that was a Phyllis and Evan Tanner thing. You know, I, I, I remember those contracts of Phyllis, and they they in all honesty, they, you know, they were really more of you give your word and I give my word and we're gonna do business together. And uh, you know, the, 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 her contracts were easy to break if somebody wanted to break them, which people shouldn't do that. You know, the, the contract I had with her, it was just, you know, if you get me a match, I'll give you 10 or 15 percent or whatever it was. You know, but if I get my own matches, you know, you, you don't get a percentage of that. But Evan, I guess, you know, Evan did get into UFC, I think, through Phyllis, I believe. I'm, you know, I'm not for sure, but I think that was who got him in there. And, uh, you know, so that whole dispute was between them and, but somehow I got pulled into it with in, in John's mind. Yeah. He couldn't have gotten the pancreas without Phyllis. Not at that time. Yeah. Like, yeah so he, I, what probably I, happened in Nevin's experience is pancreas is a possibility. He asks around and he gets directed to Phyllis. She gets that deal and gets in on, on getting him in the UFC because she has a relationship with Peretti, but then, Evan sees the limits and wants to pull out of it. That's yeah. That that, that sounds that sounds about right. Yeah, I uh, I'm not exactly how it all went because before after I don't know what they're doing because I ended up being the one that was telling Pancreas because he had a, he had a fight coming up with uh, Sammy Schultz and uh, for the Pancreas title and he also had a fight Pancreas. coming with uh, uh, Vandalay Silva who Pretty wanted the winner of that was going to go against Frank Shamrock. And this is an Evan Tanner story. We're sitting by the pool one day. We're the only ones out there and Evan's drinking a beer and he just looks over me. He says, Steve, I need you to get me out of those fights. And I said, what are you talking about? And uh, he, he had, he wanted out of it. He said, I don't have the will to fight right now. He said, I, I, he said, I don't, I want, don't want to fight Sammy Schultz or, Vandalay Silva, I said, I said, you're giving up a title fight yeah. with Pancreas and you're giving up the opportunity to fight Shamrock for the title. I mean, nobody cancels those fights. You know, and he was fighting for me in the USWF at the same time. And he, he canceled both those fights. He said he just didn't have it in him. He didn't feel like doing it at the time. You know, and, and I don't know if, if he was still with me or not. I'm pretty sure I had the USW going at that time uh, and still, but I'm, I can't remember. I can't remember. He was taking like a year and a two years off at a time in between fights. He was doing strange stuff like that, but yeah, he had me cancel two big fights for him. Uh, just, just like that. Yeah. But, no, I, you know, but then he, then he went on to win the UFC belt anyway. So, you know, so for him, it, it, it turned out okay. It worked out. But uh, but nobody else would have done something like that. Yeah, no, he had did. Evan was a guy with a lot of demons, you know, and he had, he had so much natural talent that it it didn't affect him until he got to the very, very, very top. You know, he, he, Evan, he, he the Abu Dhabi competition. I was there with him, and he came up like two days later, and I'm like after everybody showed up wearing the same clothes, and I'm like, what's going on? And he had bought booze in his in his bag. And they broke. So all his clothes was like saturated in booze. But he had been trying to bring booze into Abu Dhabi, you know, to drink wow. there. Not realizing that they had booze there. You know, it was one of the countries that you can uh, get. You're talking about the submission tournament? Yeah, yes. Yeah. Yeah, that's a strange situation, too. I, I got a call and a guy was wanting me to come to that. And I said, I'm not prepared to compete with all those guys right now. And I you know, and, and they said, what, you have somebody else that might want to go. And Evan wasn't in shape for that either. And Evan said, I just want to have the experience to be able to say I went to Abu Dhabi. I remember that too. And uh, so they flew him over there. You know, and I think in the beginning they were flying guys in and you weren't even paying your own way, that kind of stuff. And Evan got to go for nothing, you know, but, but he wasn't prepared. He didn't train. Yeah. <laughs> you know, he, he did that one time for pancreas. He had a match in Pancreas, and uh, 
I think the guy was from Holland. It wasn't Sammy, but it was somebody else. A, Leon Dyke. I was at that. That was my first yes, one. He kicked in the chest. He Stop. went to that. Evan went to that match and hadn't been training, wasn't in shape. He was do, he was doing his own thing. And uh, he went to that match thinking that he didn't have to train for that match. And that was a big, that was a big mistake. You know, when you're not in shape, even a guy much less talented than you will beat you. You know, he was, he was dominating the fight. And then that guy kicked him right in the, right in the sternum. And uh, that was it, man. I remember yeah, that. I, yeah, I assure you, he was getting tired at that point, also. Yeah, <laughs> yeah, yeah. That, it, but yeah, he. Uh, but but like I say, he still went in the end. He became a champion, you know. Yeah. You know, for for you know, once you got that belt, once you know you're a champ forever. It's kind of like an Olympic gold medal. You know, you're always the Olympic champion. You, I see the UFC is the same thing. You know, once you're the champ, you're the champ forever. So, so Steve, you obviously knew Evan quite well. I mean, it's Miguel had mentioned demons earlier. He was pretty open about it. Did Evan ever open up to you and tell you where his pain came from? Where his pain, where, where the darkness may have came from? Uh, no, I really don't want to get into any of that. I mean, I knew him pretty well. I mean, he, he would say things, but they were private things that I, I mean, I wouldn't put that out in public. That's you know, fair enough. Any of the stuff that I do know, I wouldn't put out publicly. It's cool. Okay. I respect that. I, respect I, that. I, I got a question. I, I, you talked about how uh, your very first shoe fight was around a pro wrestling event where, you know, you were asked to be like a, uh, you know, a guardian or a doorman or, or whatever the situation right, right. is. It, the pancreas, the, oh, the shoot fighting that you're talking about, there are roots in pro wrestling with like the Malenkos or, or people that are known there. You mentioned Carl Gotch and stuff. Why don't you take us through some of those, you know, really rugged guys that, that you met along the way that people don't remember? Like, a Carl, like what was your experience like with Carl Gotch? Well, I know that the UWF that was before the UWF 5, and Chris knows, a lot, a lot of those guys are the guys that went from the UWF style to the pancreas and started the pancreas style, you know, because I knew some of those guys were going to Florida to uh, Tampa to train with Carl, you know, and uh -huh. they were – and staying at his house and training and they they left that uwf style of professional wrestling style and went to pancreas style of of shoot wrestling and uh you know but i i spent like a month with carl in tampa also because my father worked for uh uh florida championship wrestling and uh wcw wrestling and he he was stationed out of tampa also and that's how i met carl was was through them but uh I trained with Carl for a month in 1990, and then I went to uh, the World Trials for Sambo, and I still got beat, you know. But in the trials in 1990, I lost. But uh, but I got the experience of being with Carl, and and uh, it was the same thing with him. It was uh, like I told you, it was doing all these squats. The first thing we did was do all the. I said we. He didn't do them with me at this point. Is I mean, he was in his 70s, but he had me do them, and. Uh, it made for a tough long month because the first time I went with him, I wasn't I wasn't in shape and ready to go. I was kind of of the mindset, well, Carl will get me in shape for this match I'm going to have at the trials for Sambo that year. And uh, you know, he did the best he could, but I just I was up I went up I went up a weight to wrestle a, a higher weight. I didn't want to cut weight. And in the sport of wrestling, that's a big mistake. I uh, <laughs> I lost that year. Even even as great as Carl's training was, I. I, I, it wasn't enough, but yeah, Carl Gotch was a, uh, a different kind of guy. Very serious, very serious. He didn't like to give compliments. Uh, he was tough on everybody. Wow. But, but those, Did you guys, those Japanese guys, Carl talked a lot about them, like Suzuki and these guys, but I didn't, I don't personally know them. Uh, I was over in the UWF with uh, like Takata and some of those guys that with a, that went a different direction, and you know the, the pancreas guys went a, a different <laughs> style. So obviously, you're in Texas. World Class Championship Wrestling was a monstrous organization in the '80s. Did you have any interaction with that organization? No, I didn't. I didn't. Uh, my father wrestled down in Dallas. Some, I believe, uh, the. The Von Erics would come to Amarillo and wrestle the Funks, and the Funks would go to 
Dallas and wrestle LeVon Erickson. They had a lot of that going on, but uh, Dallas is about uh, Dallas is about 300 miles from Amarillo, 275 miles. So I, I never even went to any of their wrestling matches back then in the eighties. I was in high school and going to college. So did no interactions with Terry Funk? Oh no, I've known Terry Funk since I was a little kid. I uh, act, t- I actually go and see Terry here and there. I I I need to go see him again. I, I was supposed to see him the other day, and and uh, he actually went to lunch with one of his old football buddies. So he ran out on me. But I need to go and talk to him and see how he's doing. That's cool. I, you know, I want to ask you because Funk is one of those guys that. He did a lot of the hardcore wrestling and stuff, and he, he's one of those guys that every that nobody in the business thinks he was a joke or a walkover or a runover. He's a, a tough guy. Like who was, in your experience, out of those guys, the you know, the Von Erichs, because you know Fritz had his reputation, and Bruiser Brody from Texas. Like rate 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 the tough guys among the pro wrestlers. You're you're talking back in a, the different era. Yeah, yeah, I'm from, like I, I'm 51. Like I remember, like Black Jack Mulligan, like was like those guys. Iceman, yeah, Iceman King Parsons. I love those guys. Yeah, I, you know, in back then I was just a kid, and uh, you know, you're probably looking at a guy like Danny Hodge. I'm not even sure if you guys know who that is. <clears throat> he was a three-time NCAA wrestling champion for Oklahoma University, Golden Gloves national boxing champion, second in the Olympics. He was a, a professional wrestler back then. Uh, you know, Carl Gotch, you know, for sure back then is one of the toughest guys out there. But you had there were a lot of guys that uh, that wrestled and wrestled in college and you didn't even know it. You know, it didn't come through their gimmick like, uh, uh, you know, who Jim Duggan is. The yeah, of course, that, Jim Duggan. Hexa. Jim Duggan that carried the, the, the flag on in the, uh, the piece of wood. Two by four. You know, even that guy was a state champion wrestler in high school, you know, so there's a lot of guys that really, if you want to talk tough guys that are probably out there, uh, uh, Bob Backlund from uh, the World Wrestling Federation, WWWF back in the day, Bob Backlund was a two-time NCAA champion and he was, he carried the belt for the World Wrestling <laughs> Federation for years, you know, but you know, and if you're looking at it nowadays, there's lots of these guys that are out there that are, are college all Americans that are in pro wrestling. You know, you've got Kurt Angle, you know, who's Olympic champion. Uh, you know, it, you can say a lot, uh, talk about a lot of tough guys, but when you say, okay, we well, got a guy like Kurt Angle who's Olympic champion, and you got Brock Lesnar, you know, who was an NCAA champion and a UFC champion. I mean, it, these guys are probably your toughest guys in all reality. I mean, because I can't, you know, these bi- other guys that are just big, tough guys that get in bar brawls, those bar brawls are a lot different when you wrestle a guy that's an Olympic champ or fight a guy that's Olympic champion or NCAA champion. You know, the things tend to turn around, you know, if you're fighting against those kind of guys. So, yeah. you know, we're wrapping up now, but the USWF, your organization, was a very powerful one back in the day. What made you like close the doors on it? What 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 made you just kind of get tired? Well, I was I was getting tired at the end. I mean, what people didn't realize for me was I was doing uh, you know I was doing judo, I was doing sambo, I was promoting the USWF, but I was also a high school teacher and a coach all at the same time, and and traveling to Japan and all these different stuff. And in 1998. Uh, Texas brought in high school girls wrestling. So I also didn't just have a boys team and teach school. I was also, I, I was just given a brand new girls wrestling team. So I was really getting tired towards the end. And I, I had went over to uh, Texas tech, which was about 120 miles from Amarillo. And I was wanting to branch out, but I, it was only 120 miles away. And I learned how hard it was to branch out into different places even to do that kind of traveling with the company. And I wasn't going to quit my teaching and coaching job. So at that point, I said, I need to close this thing down. And, and uh, I had did one show in Amarillo where I lost money. 
I wasn't on the show and not to build myself up. I was just somebody that was a big part of the, the, the card here in town. And Tanner wasn't on the thing. We always had to make sure that myself or Evan Tanner was on there. And then we had these other great guys like Paul Jones and Ollie Elias and, and Heath Herring and, you know, these different guys. But really, in reality, the show had to absolutely have me or Tanner. And Tanner was going to go off and just do UFC. And he, the way he took over was when I shut it down, he said, what do you think about me promoting? And at that time, after my last show, the boxing commission came in and they said, we're not going to let you do this under a pro wrestling license no more. You know, these are real fights and thousands of people are coming. So the boxing commission is going to take over. And uh, I told, I explained that to Tanner and Tanner went ahead and promoted a couple of shows under my, under my corporation, under my banner. And uh, it just didn't work out for him the way he, he was doing things that were a lot more expensive than I was. He was wanting to bring in guys from say uh, UFC. He brought wanted to bring them in. Well, they cost a lot more money to bring. <laughs> and at the same time, the people in Amarillo don't really know them. And they, you know, he wasn't bringing in like the UFC champ. He brought in, uh, oh, the guy that had all those fights, he's got like 300 fights. Travis oh, Fulton. Tra Travis Fulton. He brought in Travis Fulton to fight him. As many fights as Travis had, he, Amarillo still wasn't familiar with him. It, it, didn't, it didn't put more people in the building to have Travis on the card. You know, but and then and then he did a show was like the night after Thanksgiving, I think. And that was, uh, yeah, that was a hard lesson to be learned. And, you know, all my fights I did on Saturday nights and he did a show on a Friday, I think, after Black Friday. Yeah. So he, he lost he lost a lot of money on that next show. So he he just he said he can't do it no more. So then I sh shut it down again for about a year. And then Lisa Hunt who happened to be my assistant coach at the time at the high school for the girls. She said, well, what if I buy it? So I sold it to her, everything except for my video rights of, you know, USWF one through uh, 16. I gave her the, everything but that, you know, but, uh, and that, and it didn't work out for her either with the boxing commission and they were making them fly in their judges and their referees. You know, when I had the company without the boxing commission, I, I made my own judges. I would get referees from Amarillo and explain the rules and how it worked. So we had our own referees. I had coaches that and Felix that would referee the matches and they would do great jobs. Everything ran smooth. And then the boxing commission got involved and you had to use their referees, their coaches. You had to fly them all in, put them in hotels. All this stuff costs money. You guys know all that, you know, yeah. but all of that stuff, when the boxing commission gets involved, it's a whole nother ball game. Yeah, Mike yeah. Mike, and uh, his crew that up in Minnesota, the, the boxing commission kind of took over in the same way. And, and like the shows, they fell off the table. There's no shows anymore in Minnesota except on Indian territory. Yeah. yeah. So, so people understand, like Steve Nelson, he says it's important that he's on the card. Watch some of the pro wrestling matches that Steve does in, in his hometown, the entire audience is chanting his name. And it's not a thin audience. There's a couple thousand people there. Like you, you carried a lot of weight. No, at that I, time. I appreciate that. Thanks. Yeah, yeah no, you were I'm over. I'm a New Yorker, but I, I remember getting full contact fighter. And yours is definitely one of the shows that was important. It was, it was covered. one of the most important yeah. shows. Go yeah, ahead. We were real important to get to go like into Japan. I mean, if, if you went through the USWF, you were real likely to get, you know, you were likely to get seen by these reporters. And the president of Shudo, uh, I think his name was uh, Takashima. Well, anyway, the, the president of, uh, of Shudo came to Amarillo also with, with the Japanese group of reporters that came and watched our show. And uh, they came to... USWF seven and we had like myself and Ali Elias, Frank Trid, Tanner, all these guys were on one show, you know, and, and everybody ended up in Japan getting and, and Heath Herring. Uh, you know, Heath Herring was for one of my guys from USWF and he went off to Holland to train with 
you know, you guys know this, Chris, you know, that he ended up being oh, yeah. number two in pride. He was, he was under Fedor Emelianco, you know, and he, you know, he also was from Amarillo. So a lot of these, you know, and Tanner won the, the title and Paul Buntello got to fight for the title. You know, Paul's from, uh, Paul Buntello's from Amarillo USWF. He went to high school here, the same school as Tanner. You know, Carlo so Prater. Carlo Prater did too. He fought, he fought for you. Carlo Prater fought for me. Yeah. And, yeah. uh, yeah, and Paul Buntello, I mean, I forgot to talk about him very much, but, you know, Paul ended up going to Russia a few times. And, you know, if you're winning matches over in Russia, that's a pretty big deal. You know, oh, yeah. he won matches over there. He fought uh, Arlovsky for the belt, for the UFC heavyweight belt. You know, and him and Tanner from here in Amarillo, like I said, from the same high school. You know, I, I, was, I was lucky. I came in at the right time, and Amarillo had a lot of – a lot of talent, you know, like it, like Ali Elias was a world freestyle wrestling champion from Iran. He just happened to be living here. He, he went to college in Nebraska and moved to Amarillo. The, you know, these were, uh, Paul Jones is a two time NCAA runner up. I, Paul, Paul Jones, these guys, guys get enough credit. In, all these guys were in one town. So it was just, <laughs> you know, it, I mean, it, think, if you think about that, having that kind of luck and coming in at the right time, it was, it was fortunate and lucky and it was lucky for all of us because we got to travel the world a little bit, you know, and get to do some things because of the MMA business. Or as they said in the nineties, Chris, the no holds barred, you know, NHB, it's what it was. It was NHB, MMA, NHB. Yeah. I mean, I, I, I was real fortunate to be part of it and promote it. And, you know, I, I didn't win a lot and I didn't make millions of dollars, but I'm, I, I, I mean, I watched it this last week, Thursday through, uh, Sunday. I mean, I watched Tyson Fury fight in the morning at, or at three o'clock in the afternoon. And then I watched the UFC and, you know, on Thursday, I watched PFL and Friday, I watched Bellator. And I mean, I really enjoy it. I mean, I, I really do. Have you, have you transitioned over to watching some of the bare knuckle fights? I watch it. Yeah. That's okay. Whenever, uh, uh, Miguel uh, contacted me and he said, it's your show. I knew who it was right away. Sure. Yeah, I, I, love, I love. We got some this weekend in uh, Montana. I got Joe Riggs gonna be fighting versus Lorenzo Hunt. It's a main event. I can't wait, man. So these, those are so fun for me to watch. It reminds me a lot oh, of the man, early days of, MMA, sure. of of NHB because it's still new, raw, it's fun. I love it. Oh, do you you guys know Eddie Goldman? Oh yeah, of course. Yeah, Eddie called me. Oh, maybe say a month ago and was talking about you know uh, bare knuckle. Uh, boxing and and I told him I was surprised that that was back because you know that was the big deal in UFC in the beginning and Eddie was talking about what great potential you know uh, bare knuckle fighting has you know to become much bigger now and uh, I really enjoy it I and I think oh uh, Mike Perry I think he's found a home I mean he needs to he doesn't need to grapple he needs to be in bare knuckle <laughs> fighting. I mean, that, yeah. I really believe that guy has found a home. That last guy he fought, they both have a home, I think. <laughs> Julian, <laughs> Julian Lay, boy, they put on a hell of a fight, man. I mean, oh. I'm liking it. I'm liking it. you got a lot of guys. One thing I always say about it is a lot of times now in the UFC or boxing, you get a lot of guys in there who are like, it's an athletic contest. You know, who's going to win this contest? Bare knuckles is just a fight. You know what I mean? It's a still a fight. That's what – that's what – MMA was or, or NHB was back in the day. Now you get a lot more money and skill there. People are trying to outpoint people or hold them down or push them against the fence. Bare knuckles are fight, and that's what that's what I think people love about it. It's fun to watch. Oh, and, and you're and I've been watching since you, since it came back. And I mean, you can see just over the last year the transition of everybody's getting better. You're getting oh, yeah. better athletes, better fights, better competition. I mean, you can just see bare knuckle fighting moving and moving. Yeah. I, uh, I I own the, the Bare Knuckle app, so I can watch you guys all the time. And I mean, you had a big boxing career uh, on top of the MMA, and you're 3-0 in, in uh, no, or Bare Knuckle fight, and I'm ready for you to come back. <laughs> you got to get off the commentator seat and get back in there. <laughs> Only way I'll do it is if they'll let me commentate the whole time and then right, then just step in there for my fight, you know, and then, <laughs> then come back and commentate every <laughs> Like, hey. okay, I'll be back. Take the headset off. No box. I'll be done. You know, I'm, maybe hey, I'm sure they can work that into your contract. I'll be looking forward to it. You might have to do that in Montana. 
<laughs> there we go. Hey, I do love me some bare knuckle. It's fun stuff to watch. And uh, four ninety nine a month. I'm like, man, can we up the pay a little bit so I can make more money? You know, because this ain't right. But uh, it's like for the price of the whole year, you get that'd be less than one UFC. You know what I mean? Right, one pay per view. Right. I'm like, man, the whole year you get for like sixty bucks. It's nuts. But it's just fun to watch. I love it. Well, it's best Chile combat sports. I've got the greatest wife in the world. She she watches all of it. She watches all wow. of it. From Bellator to UFC, the bare knuckle fighting, PFL, and she loves it all. And uh, I didn't I didn't know her. Well, I, I'm also lucky. She's about 45 and I'm 58. She's a little younger than me. But when she was like 21 years old, she was watching me fight in Amarillo at the at the arena. And I didn't meet her until <laughs> like you know, 15 something years later, you know. Wow. But she wow. loved she was going to the fights live. And now she watches it with me all the time. She loves it. That's, That's cool. awesome. Yeah. You yeah. Bringing, have you What's that? About, have you thought about bringing the old USW thing back? I mean, you know, I every once in a while something like that goes through my mind. But I have watched companies come and go in Amarillo, like uh, Shark Fights. Uh, uh, Cody Fister had a uh, uh, a new company here in Amarillo. And as hard as they tried, times have just changed. And it's so expensive now. I mean, it is so, for me back in the 90s, paying a guy, say, $500, and that was for a better guy for just a, a for his match, that was big money back then. You know, I would have guys that were fighting for me for $100, winner take all. I mean, those kinds of things in the 90s. You know, I mean, guys like Don Fry and, and Dan Severin, you know, they made more. You know, of course, Gracie made plenty, but, you know, in the 90s, everybody wanted to be a star. Everybody wanted to get out there and was willing to fight for almost nothing. You know, these days, a guy that no one even knows, they want $1,500 just to show up, you know, on a show, on a, a show that no one's even coming to see them. And that's yep. it's just not workable anymore for me to do that. I, I think there's a market market for the style of USWF and pancreas. There is a market for people like me that love that and, and love and love MMA, but to be the promoter and put all your money on the line and, you know, you might lose all of it. Times have just changed. I mean, a big show for me used to cost me 20,000 bucks in the nineties. I mean, I'll, I'll bet you minimum, it would cost 60, 70, you know, minimum these days. You know, yeah, like you're talking about, you got the commission involved, and that takes a big chunk of it. You got to pay taxes on everything, pay these all these different people to fight. I mean, it, it costs a lot more with the commission. Well, you know, the fighters, you know, most of them don't have the, the beginning fighters. They don't they don't even have four hundred dollars in the bank savings. <laughs> and when the boxing commission comes in, they got to go get physicals. They got to get eye tests. They got to do all these tests, which cost about four hundred dollars. Well, the fighters want to put that over to the promoter because they really can't afford it. Well, the promoters can't afford to be paying four hundred dollars for all these guys either. If you're working a small show, you know it, it's just the era from the '90s to now. the The landscape is just so much different. You know, I I think about promoting again, but I also think there's a lot of egos involved in this now too. You know, oh, yeah. and, you know, in the '90s, people were happy to fight. You know. And I was fighting with them and training with a lot of these guys. So we had good relationships. Now it would just be me being the promoter and the boss. And I just don't think it would have that same uh, effect as it did back then. Steve, you were fortunate enough to be in the what we call the wild, wild west days. Of MMA. That's right. <laughs> yeah, I, I was having MMA under the professional wrestling license. It doesn't get any <laughs> better than that. I mean, I made the rule. I made the rules. And everything had to go down how I said, you know, I mean, but we yeah. had, you know, two guys back then were so cool. I had two doctors that were there every time. And all they would say is give me 10 tickets for free for my friends and I'll work the matches for free. You know, I would have an ambulance that showed up. I mean, it, and all the guys signed contracts if they got taken off to the, you know, off to the hospital, they had to pay their own bill. You know, yeah. things, things were just different back then. I loved it back then, man. It was fun. Yes, sir. Yes, sir. Well, hey, man, I mean, I appreciate your time. Thank you for coming back here and rehashing these stories. But not only that, I'd like to thank you for your contribution. I mean, 
this sport wouldn't have gotten to where it was today if it weren't for people like you doing that. I mean, there wasn't many shows. You, Miguel, I mean, it, yeah, you guys built the sport, man. So just appreciate what you guys did for all of them. Well, we also had guys like you and, and uh, Mike and Miguel, you know, doing what you do and and you with 75 or 80 fights between boxing and you know bare <laughs> knuckle and mma i mean i mean if it wasn't for people like you this sport would be nowhere you know and i well, thank you man you no know, it's it's like i say and you know you did a fantastic job in your career and i uh when uh, miguel said you want to be on chris lytle's show i knew who you were right away and and oh. be honest with you i've actually turned down some of these shows that's why i didn't have any camera or any of this because i just didn't want to do it when it's your show. I said yes. And well, I appreciate. I, I, it, man. I have a lot of respect for you and what you guys do and hashing out the history with everybody. I really do. Well, don't compliment well, you know, too much. You just get rid of me and Mike, man. <laughs> <laughs> no, man. But, but to be honest with you, um, starting I started in the late nineties, and man, those are the best stories. Like you have to. We gotta. We gotta record these stories of people like yourself because. It's not people don't understand that the new way it is. It's not the same and where it came from, what needs to be recorded. That's why we like to do this so people can hear where the sport came from. And I mean, you're a great example of that. But man, these people nowadays don't get it and they will now because they, they're going to see what it was like by, by listening to these stories. Right, right. And yeah, and for a lot of people out there, what's funny is what we got paid back then. I don't know what any of your smallest pay, paydays were, but when I wrestled Soccer Raba in the UWF, you know, my pay was a thousand dollars the first couple of times, you know, and I tell somebody that and they, they can't believe it because they think everybody's making millions of dollars. And now I have to explain it was just worth the trip. You know, it was a free trip. You know, it was the greatest experience in the world. Yeah. It was costing them a lot of money to bring me, you know, but you know, in, in the nineties, I was, you know, I was broke. So I, it didn't bother me to take a thousand dollars home. I was happy on the way out back to the airport with my passport. <laughs> <laughs> I'm looking at you. A thousand dollars, man! You had a good deal. That was what a good deal you had. <laughs> yeah, I, I talked. I talked to a pro wrestler, a guy named Ray Stevens, before I went to Japan. I don't know if you guys know who that is. The uh, uh, at Ray, my father used to wrestle over there too, and and Ray I, Ray said, "How much are you getting?" I said, "I get a thousand dollars a match." Ray goes, "A thousand dollars a match." He he goes, "We used to get twelve hundred dollars a week." You know, he, he didn't realize I wasn't fighting every night. <laughs> but, you know, that, but yeah, it, it was the greatest experience in the world and coaching wrestling, being a wrestler. And, and I know that you were a high school wrestler, Chris. And I mean, it, it, uh, I wouldn't, I got some injuries and this and that, like a lot of guys, but I haven't talked to a, a guy yet that says that they would trade their, you know, their, uh, their experiences with wrestling and fighting and everything. Nobody would trade it. Sometimes we have complaints with promoters or pay or one thing or another, but I don't hear anybody saying I wouldn't do it all over again. No, and you know, I love all the, all the old school guys. They, they all fought for the right reason. You know, it's like they did this because they loved it. There, there was no money involved. There was no fame That's or right. glory. It was just, right. you just enjoyed it. That's there. We're missing something that of that nowadays, but uh, I, that's why everybody who did it back in the day, I got like uh, not only respect for, but like, I like him. I root for him. I just uh, they're yeah, they're, yeah. they're kindred spirits. I understand what they what they think. You know what I mean? It's a great thing. Yeah, and I hope all these new guys. You know, it's just like pro wrestling. They didn't make a lot back then. Everybody's making more. It's a different time. I hope these guys make even a lot more. You know, I hope, yeah. I, I hope all these companies spread out the wealth between the fighters and and the owners. I mean, there's got to be money for everybody. You know, but I hope they spread the wealth a little bit more for everybody, so everybody can do real well. Yep. Yep. Excellent. Thank you. I mean, Steve, an absolute honor. Um, I, we've yeah. never met, but you're an old school cat, man. I've, I've got a world of respect for you and everything you've done for the sport. Thank you. Mark, I, I appreciate you having me on here. I, I really do. I really do. Anything you need from us, Steve, you let me know, bub. All right. Thanks, guys. Appreciate yeah, y'all. I just want to wrap with two things. There were two things that when we, I was going into this interview, I felt and that one was the word Mike mentioned in the intro was we're going to be speaking with a pioneer. You know, this is an absolute pioneer. There's no doubt about it. And then the other part of it is, is we have another guy. This guy's a lifelong martial artist, pure and simple. And for that, you've earned everybody here's respect. Thank you very much, Steve. Wait, wait, wait. One thing, oh, you, you. you got to Oklahoma right after the Schultz brothers, correct? 
Yeah, well, I my freshman year, Mark was still there. Okay. Well, are you there? Yeah, I'm oh. sorry. I, I just I know we're winding up, but dude, I'm a yeah, I'm a well, Schultz my, brother. My fan. freshman year, Mark was still at OU for one more year, and uh, then at, then after that, he was gone. But, Absolute uh, savage. Yes, yes, and uh, we lost uh, we lost Dave Schultz way too soon. You know, he was only 36 years old. You know, with the Dupont deal and. You know, he he was the greatest. I mean, I I had spoke with him and been to some of his camps whenever I was younger that he had did. And he was a, he was a wonderful man and an ambassador of the sport. He was wonderful. Excellent. Steve, thank you, sir. Yes. Thank thanks, you, guys. Man. I appreciate y'all. Well, Mike, we're back and uh, we got Steve Nelson in the books. A good lead off for the return here. And uh, that's the Lights Out podcast in a nutshell. History. You know, it's a history podcast. I'd say. I mean, we get a pretty hardcore fan base, um, but I'd say probably a lot of the people in our hardcore fan base aren't too familiar with Steve Nelson, but he's a pioneer, man. Guys like Steve Nelson, those are the interviews that we have to get. Yeah, we try to sprinkle them in, in between people that maybe are not as vanilla, you know, maybe a little more salacious, but guys like Steve, Adrian Serrano is a guy that's going to be coming up soon too. I don't know when, but, but he will. Um, those are guys that we got to get. Yeah, you know, Steve ran that Texas organization, you know, in the 90s, and he put a lot of people on the map. And he kind of felt like, oh, you know, what, what are we going to talk about? We got almost two hours out of him just in the blink of an eye. So, you know, I, I think that's what it's all about. I think, you know, obviously the guy, you know, Oklahoma State, and the wrestling names, you know, the Ron Tripp story is a story I haven't heard or talked about in a real long time. But I remember Ron, I can, Ron is a guy that I shared the message boards with. Like, I can't call him a friend, but like, we've had conversations. I've talked to Ron numerous times online and stuff like that in the 90s. Yeah. So that was just wild. To, to, you know, really an old school guy. He might be a good Clips channel conversation you know good 15 20 minutes on a round trip um i mean I, from what i remember the fight was over like within 10 seconds like i i hadn't thought of that fight in forever i mean obviously i knew who round trip was but i you know it's it's it's, it's kind of like mark schultz you know somebody that people should probably pay attention to yeah yeah so definitely uh thank you to steve you know gentlemen i knew he was but uh you know he proved it again, and uh, yeah. it was definitely definitely something that uh, we're looking forward to. You know, bringing him back. We're going to go on a weekly schedule now, and uh, we have to, we have to. Yeah. You know, pound out, pound out a week, uh, an interview a week, and uh, get people, you know, into the deep dives and just keep going. So we're back. Thank you to Chris Lytle. No, and, uh, no, wait, Miguel, Miguel. This is where we have to tell our audience. It's their fault that we're going to a weekly schedule. Yeah, it is. It is. It's actually, you know, I I don't see like an upswing in the elderly, which means you're not signing using your parents' phones and things to like sign up for YouTube. And, and it's not, you know, we need we need more share likes and subscribes. We'd like to see more share likes and subscribes. We keep doing it anyway, but. Hey, we took a little break because this is what I'm thinking, Miguel. Because it, it, this is what know, I'm thinking. You guys are. This is what I'm thinking. Break. What I'm thinking is, if somebody could just like maybe chain themselves to like a billboard, like on like a major, like a major highway, and just spray paint "Lights Out Podcast" like on it, so it makes the news. Dude, I'll send a free T-shirt for that. Yeah, I think I think so. I think that's good. I think that's good. Like, I think if somebody could like run on the stage, like with, with, with Will Smith, except with like a lights out, maybe with like marker written real poorly, lights out podcast on their shirt, I'd send a free T-shirt for that. Yeah, maybe the next UFC event, you know, one of the fighters can come out with a back tattoo that says "Lights Out Podcast." If they actually would, tattoo it, not that kind of stuff. I would I would send a T-shirt for that. <laughs> they, they, they might actually have to get it really legitimately tattooed. Yeah, no but, henna, no henna. Yeah. So the um, 
laser surgery afterwards, well, that's on you. But the tattoo, like, we'll pay a t-shirt for. Like, like a face tattoo. A Lights Out face tattoo. Lights Out podcast. Yeah. They get a free t-shirt. They get a free t-shirt. We, we can do that, too. So, or... Uh, you know, if you show up like a, a Trump or a Biden rally, because I don't really care, but either one of them, if you troll them and you get in the background with a Lights Out t-shirt, we'll send you another t-shirt. That's true. You'd have to make the first one yourself. Yeah. But the second one would be the official one. <laughs> you got to prove yourself. Got to prove yourself. Yeah, Biden rally. I tell you what, Biden rally probably be it. I mean, there's no one watching it or really showing up to those things, but like it would guarantee some TV time. For sure. Like if you're one of those panel guests like on CNN, which that's another organization that no one has really seems to be watching now. But even a panel guest where you just kind of yell at each other and nothing gets resolved and nobody really stays on subject. They just kind of yell their shouting points and the Lights Out podcast there would be great too. And a t-shirt there. That'd be yeah, fantastic. You could, you could, uh, anything like that, like an interview, like any, any type of like uh, attempt at, at gathering money for Ukraine or charities like that, you know, dog rescues, anything like that. Just come, you know, drive by, right down by that. We'll send you a t shirt. Like, like those videos in China where they're putting all their dogs in bags and shit. Like, if you were to come in there with like one of those Tyvek suits on, because that's where everybody in China wears right now, but then like a lights out podcast t shirt over your Tyvek suit when you're collecting all those bags of animals, that would get another additional and probably a shout out if you're not in prison. I get yeah. you a shout out for that one. Yeah, that, I mean, we're willing to do, you just gotta be willing to commit, you know? We're I mean, reasonable. We're being reasonable here, Miguel. Well, all I'm saying is downloading the podcast isn't enough. It's not a big deal. Just download the goddamn podcast. Especially it's not a big deal. If you don't have like a criminal record, like you might, you know, maybe a misdemeanor that involves a Lights Out podcast, get the name out there, that, that might help too. Like just check your criminal records. You can give, you can I, give. Those like high speed chases in California, they get aired. Maybe like a Lights Out podcast flag that's yeah. on your car. Uh-huh. They're not locking anybody up. That's a misdemeanor right now. Like th that's a misdemeanor. Like driving around crazy in traffic and doing U-turns you're not supposed to. Those are all misdemeanors. Those are things that they're not going to affect your work. You could do those things for us. You could you could walk into a supermarket, get like a big bag of like detergent, pour it on the floor, and pee lights out podcast into the. That'll get you attention for, for a viral yeah. video. <laughs> I mean, there's so many ideas, guys. So anyway, we're going long here. Hey. Hey, military, military, hey. write lights out podcast on a bomb, take a picture, send it to us. I got you. You know, what's really sad about this is that Steve Nelson was a, like a classy guy. It was a classy interview and, and we ended this way. So, you know, that's true. That's true. That's true. Right. Either way, Miguel, like, share, subscribe. I don't know. I mean, I think we've kind of made our point up until this, you know, at this point in the interview, but, uh, yeah, like, share, subscribe. Guys, we have to cut back. We got to go back and really concentrate on our jobs because it's like we got like a decent following, but it's it's not paying the bills, man. And, and it's it's a shame, but we're not doing this for, for fame, fortune. We're doing this to document history, which is why we're going to do as much as we possibly can for you guys. Yeah, it'd be just great to break even, and that's, uh, you know, the, the goal here. So we got... We Still got difficult to do. And we'll see how we do. Thanks, guys, and thank you very My much. Man. to Who's classy, Steve Bells? Love you, brother. See you, see you next interview, Miguel. Check out the full interview on iTunes, Spotify, and all major podcast platforms.